welcome to parents and families maybe or mentors, everyone who is here for the FSM Parent Workshop. And yes, it was a terribly long walk, so I hope you made it to the right place. Um, but in case I have not met you, my name is Jill Sullivan, and I get to work with our student ministry here at FaithBridge. And honestly, one of the privileges and honors of getting to work in student ministry is that it is not just ministry with students. It is very much partnership of us as student ministry staff with parents. The best ministry happens when leaders and us as staff are linked in arms with you guys as parents um, to best develop and best minister to our students. So nights like this are honestly thrilling to us because this is the display in this room of the partnership between us as a student ministry and parents who are all pouring into the same students. It just makes me smile thinking about it. Um, so tonight we are going to dive in to the topic of what is going on in their heads when we think about students and the way they process things or the decisions they make, a lot of times we ask ourselves, what is going on to make them make that decision? Um, why are they facing pressures that they are, that are truly meant for 10 years down the road, but they're facing it as a 13 or 14 year old? Um, so tonight in our partnership, we will all get to experience um, growth and development ourselves within that topic of what is going on in their heads. So for the evening, we are going to hear from two, actually three different speakers. Um, the first is going to be Dr. Looney, who I will introduce in just a minute. We will then have a quick break between him and our second speaker, speakers. And then we will welcome up to the stage Dan and Becky Slagle as our second half of the evening. And then at the end of the night, we will have a question and answer panel. So with that said, as we go through the evening and you're hearing the sessions that are up on stage, write down on either your booklet or somewhere or keep it in your head if you don't forget things like me. Um, but write down any questions you have that you would want to ask the panel at the end of the night. So keep those uh, rolling in your head. So with all of that, I'm going to pray for us, and then I will introduce our first speaker so that we can get the ball rolling. Sound good? All right. Well, if you will bow your heads and pray with me. God, we, we are thankful um, for students. I am thankful for the ways that they seek you the ways that they are searching for you, God, and the ways that they are poured into by us, a lot of us in this room. So God, as we pour out to students, would tonight you pour into us as people who are influencers of them? And as we ask the question, what is going on in their head? God, would you help answer that for us tonight? Would you give us an answer that is wise and insightful and truly is linked with what is going on with them. Um, so God, push us toward truth and push us toward new understanding tonight. God, we thank you for Dr. Looney and for Dan and for Becky and their willingness to come speak to us. So God, we love you and we pray this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so our first speaker is Dr. Paul Looney, who is from the Woodlands, Texas, and he has been a practicing psychiatrist um, and pastor and master. Pastor. Oh, pastor. Pastor. Pastor yeah. and masters. Yeah. I just added that in for 25 years. So he has a lot of knowledge and insight to share with us. So if you will um, clap with me as we welcome Dr. Paul Looney. Thank you, Jill. Wow, how awesome to be with you all this evening. Can you hear me okay? Beautiful. So um, yes, I am Looney and I'm a psychiatrist. Um, when our kids were little, we figured when our first one was getting ready to go to preschool that we should break the news that our name means crazy. And so Adam, our oldest, was a little dismayed to find out his main name went crazy, meant crazy. And so he said, well, we should change our name. So we're like, oh, what will you change it to? And he said, well, how about Redleaf? Well, that's kind of a nice name, Dr. Redleaf. Um, but we 
explained to him that would be problematic, be a lot of ha- headache and hassle. We're probably going to stick with Looney. And he's like, okay. So he came back ad- after a day or so, and he said, Mom, Dad, I figured out why our name is Looney. And we said, oh, you did? Why is our name Looney? And he said, it's because we're crazy about each other. <laughs> so that's a true story. Um, and all of us um, love those moments when our kids feel crazy about us and we feel crazy about them. But sometimes they also make us feel crazy, and we make them crazy as well. The good news is that we have a Heavenly Father who's crazy about all of us, and um, He loves us more than we can imagine, and He loves our kids more than we do. So He's on our side. He wants to help us. But I want to talk a little bit about um, parenting and the teenage brain. And um, the cool thing about my profession is that it's a tremendous time to be alive because for many, many centuries, millennia, we really had no way to look in the black box here. We had no way to really get inside and see what was going on in, inside our heads. Now, with the um, technologies we have ava- available now, like something called fMRI, it's a functional MRI scan, we can actually see what's happening inside there when we think certain thoughts or take certain actions. And so it's opening up a whole new world for us to understand really what's going on in the mind and the brain. And um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the brain of a teenager. Now, by age six, the brain reaches about 90% of its adult size, but it's nowhere near finished developing. We're going to focus a lot on that blue or purple, whatever color that is, uh, the frontal lobe. Um, This is where um, we handle our thoughts, uh, voluntary behavior, memory, goal formation, abstract thinking, planning, and impulse control. This is a part of the brain that is vital for us to be the kind of people that can do a good job of of managing life and making good choices. Um, Unfortunately, the teen brain is under construction. Um, It has not really reached full maturity. Um, though, though by the time it's six, the brain is about the, the size it's going to be. Um, it has a lot of remodeling to do before it's really ready to handle the adult world. So this is just a picture of, I forget, I've got to click here and there. Um, this is the average teenage brain. Um, probably the love lobe's a little too big for a boy, maybe, maybe that big for a girl. But um, it's kind of a, a humorous view of the teenage brain. But the brain remodeling um, that goes on from childhood to adulthood is really intensely happening during the teenage years. Um, Even before puberty, there are changes starting to happen in the the person's brain. And um, even though most kids will develop in about the same order, um, they're uh, the trajectory of their brain development can, de- can vary a lot depending on puberty and other, other factors. Um, so we're going to look a little bit about um, how this, this transformation happens. And if you look at the, the uh, graph that's up there from 5 years to 20, you can see that the cortex, the gray matter, the part of your brain where you're actually able to think and reason really changes dramatically. And it's not finished at age 20. It's not until mid-20s that the human brain really is able to function well and to make good choices. Um, That uh, thinking and processing part, the gray matter, um, is really radically being changed by doing two things. One, things that are not being used are pruned away. Our brains are always in the process of remodeling. And any pathways or activities that we do not use get pruned away. Um, The old adage is use it or lose it. And this is really true of the human brain. Um, There's the deep in this part of the brain, um, the white matter, is where we have something called the limbic system. If you want a kind of a little picture of what the brain is like, you can hold your hands up like this, put your thumbs in, and curl your fingers over your thumbs, okay? If you put them together, that's like the two hemispheres of your brain. The, the, the uh, front part of your brain, the prefrontal frontal cortex, is like your fingers. That's the part of your brain that is responsible for thinking, reason, planning, um, logic, um, and, and being able to um, ec- execute uh, activities. 
But deep in the core of your brain, where your thumb is, is what we call the limbic system. This is where the amygdala is. This is where you, where you have emotion. This is where you have motivation. And it turns out that teenagers have a very heightened um, reaction to the, the events that happen in their life. Their amygdala, their limbic system, lights up way bigger than an adult brain. And so when they um, get snubbed by a friend or have a breakup or um, break a nail or whatever, their, their emotional response can be huge. And it's baffling to us because we don't really understand why they're reacting the way that they are. But it's, it, it's a physiological thing. We all know what it's like when we, get, um, when we get highly aroused emotionally, when we have intense anger or rage, when somebody cuts us off in traffic, or, or we have huge anxiety. All of us can have um, our brain hijacked by our amygdala or our, our limbic system. When we get aroused emotionally, the front of part of our brain can go offline. It's like we flip our lids and we become at the mercy of our limbic system. That's when we do and say stupid things um, because we're at the mercy of our emotional self and not our rational self. While that happens, hopefully, just occasionally for you and me, it can happen a lot for kids um, where they're at the mercy of their amygdala and they don't have the ability to control their impulses. So uh, here's, a, here's a picture of the, the teenage mouse I can totally get away with this um, because we, we don't have the ability to think about consequences, to plan ahead, to, to rein in impulses. And so that's where your teenager can get in, in trouble by doing things that really are not very helpful. So this, this slide says neurons that fire together wire together. That means that when you have synapses or connections in your brain that... Um, that you uh, reinforce over time, they get stronger and stronger. The, um, the myelin sheath around a nerve cell grows the more it's used. And so whatever you do, and particularly um, in those formative years of teenage years, it's really important that you reinforce um, the things that you want to, uh, want to see more of and you don't reinforce the things you want to see less of. Neurons out of sync fail to link. That means that if you can if you can uh, avoid certain behaviors in your teenager, it will make a big difference uh, later on. For, uh, for an example, we're going to talk about pornography later. If you can prevent your child being exposed too early, which is super hard these days, um, then you will be doing them a huge favor because later on when their brain remodeling is, is a little further on, they're not likely to develop the addictive pathways that they will if those neurons fire together early on before that brain formation is, is complete. If you want to think about the brain like a tree, uh, I'm a big gardener and I love to prune. Um, and you can do a lot with it, uh, a plant in terms of fruitfulness and form by pruning it well. And um, this is true of the teenage brain too. It's really important to have healthy boundaries to get them into good patterns of behavior, whether it be getting up at a certain time or keeping the room clean. Um, the things that you reinforce will get bigger. The things that you, um, that you discipline or, or set boundaries to will shrink. And this is, it's, it's really good news for us as parents because we can help those things um, that we want to, uh, to reinforce get stronger. It's important to create incentives for your child to be active spiritually, emotionally, relationally, physically, intellectually. And we want them to love God with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength because the, ac the preferred activities become hardwired in the brain. Um, the more that we can enforce those things, the better the child is later. Now, they may drift away from those things, but the Bible says that if you train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he won't depart from it. Those early paths that are hardwired in the brain, um, they can come back to. So much of, of what your child um, develops depends on how they spend their time. Um, what your child spends time on, they're likely to, is likely to be reinforced. So you want to think about what are the range of activities that your child um, is, is involved with. Music, sports, study, languages, video games. Um, how are these shaping the sort of brain that your child is going to take into adulthood? Uh, back when I was a kid, this, uh, 
the way we spent our time might have looked more like this pie, with uh, watching TV playing a pretty big role, um, sports, religious activities, homework, hanging out. Um, this is kind of what our world looked like um, back in the old days. Uh, but this is not how kids spend their time now. A lot of kids live on devices. They spend a lot of time engaging with a screen, whether it be a computer screen, an iPad, or a phone, and this shapes their brain so much. Um, whenever they feel bored, frustrated, whatever, they can reach for a device, and that ends up being very important in how their brain is shaped. And we'll talk a little bit more about smartphones in a little bit. But, but teens that spend more the time than average on screen activities are more likely to be unhappy. They're more likely to suffer from depression, more likely to suffer from anxiety than those who spend more time in engaged in activities that are non-screen activities. I mean, there's no exception. Whatever on-screen activity your child is involved in, it's probably going to dampen their sense of happiness and well-being. Um, eighth graders who spend 10 or more hours a week on social media um, are 56% 56, uh, 56 more likely to say they're unhappy than those who devote less time. Now, that's, that may be a, uh, seem like a lot, but even, even those who spend um, six to nine hours are still 47% more likely to say they're unhappy than teens who spend less time. So it's really important to limit the time that kids spend in front of a screen. There are a lot of things that we can do that help the, the, the teen brain. Um, you can help by uh, taking, oh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, before I talk about how you can help, while your child's brain is developing, they are more likely to take risk or choose high-risk activities. Again, it goes back to that lack of prefrontal development and the, uh, the, the hyper-arousal of the limbic system or the amygdala. They're more likely to be impulsive, to lose, use poor judgment, to not think ahead. Um, they're going to express more and stronger emotions and they're going to make, uh, tend to make more impulsive decisions. But fortunately, um, we can help them learn restraint. Restraint. We can help their brains to develop better. Um, there are several ways we can do that. So first, you can encourage positive behavior. This isn't always easy. Um, sometimes kids are very resistant to uh, positive suggestions. They really want to just follow the crowd. It's easy to spend time on uh, on a device and much more challenging sometimes to have face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. We can promote um, good thinking skills and help our kids get sleep. The brain really needs sleep, and this is especially important for teenagers who need extra sleep. Um, their brains typically are skewed in terms of their sleep-wake cycle, so teenagers typically want to stay up later and sleep later. Unfortunately, the school system doesn't always Take that into account. And so your, your teen is often going to be sleep deprived. They can catch up some on the weekend, but you want to do your best to make sure that they're getting a good night's sleep because the stresses that they're under, um, particularly in, in the world that we live in now, they really need to have their rest. They really need to be able to get sleep. So um, it's also true that they're going to learn a lot by watching you. They're going to develop some of your good habits and some of your bad habits. Um, fortunately, you can help them with their intense feelings. You can help them do a better job of managing their emotions by helping them learn to talk about them. Um, what we know is that what's inside of us um, is much less scary and compelling when we get it out. And if you can get your kids to talk with you, it will be huge. One of the things we know about the brain is that being able to talk or write about something changes the way that we relate to it. I'm a big fan of the Psalms, and in the Psalms, David starts out often in a very negative mental state or emotional state. But as he goes through the Psalm, he almost always gets to a better place. What happens when you talk or when you journal is that the, the, the negative emotion that we feel in our brains, usually on the right side, which is also where we process autobiographical data, anything that's happened to you in your life, you store it over here on the right. As we, as we talk or write, that information has to travel over to the left side where we process language. We're also more logical and where we process positive feelings. So when you talk about um, 
if you get your kid to talk about something that's going on at school, as they hear themselves speak, those words come back in and they tra traverse back and forth so that the child begins to shift in the way they respond to that information. Same thing is true if they write. Um, if they write about something, particularly something traumatic, um, as they see the words, comes in, crosses over, and the relationship that we have with those feelings and those thoughts begins to shift. I'm a big fan of journaling. I have journals that go back to when I was 16 years of, of age, and I, I'm amazed at some of the things I said, some of the stupid things, and some of the brilliant things. But I am a big fan of journaling. Now, you have to, though, uh, if you want to encourage your kids to journal, you have to give them safety because if they're going to put their scary thoughts on paper, they don't want you to see their scary thoughts because some of what they say on paper um, will really scare you too much. Now, if they leave their journal out where you can see it, that may be their cry for help. But I am a big fan of, of teaching children to name their feelings and to, and to work with them. Um, there's a lot of research that says that if you can put a name to feelings and talk them out, you will have the feelings rather than the feelings having you. That is, they're less likely to drive behavior that you don't want. Um, there's a psych uh, psychiatrist named Dan Siegel. He's written some wonderful books. Uh, Mindsight is one of them. He uses the phrase, name it to tame it, that when you actually name an emotion, you can get a handle on it. You can tame it, and that can be super helpful. Um, if you think about um, uh, turning on the light to those dark places in your, in your child's mind, um, again, it may be a little scary for you to go there. But if you remember as a kid when something was dark, uh, scary in a dark room, when you turn the light, you realize it's not a monster. It's just a coat over the chair. Um, and so a lot of times if we will just get our children to talk and keep ourselves calm, they will get themselves through to a better place. The problem that we have in dealing with our kids' emotions is that we get aroused when they're aroused. We feel so passionately about them that when they're frightened or they're angry or they're upset, it's tempting for us to take that on. However, probably the number one uh, task of moving from childhood to adulthood is establishing emotional separateness from your parents. And so if you can keep yourself calm in the face of their upset, you're leading the way and helping them learn to be emotionally separate from you so that they learn how to not be reactive, but to be reflective, which is what we want in their brain. So some of the things you can do to, um, to help your kid, um, let them take some healthy risk. Let them do some things that may seem a little risky, but the consequences are lower. Um, two of our boys went through a phase where they had blue hair and, you know, did other crazy things um, that were a little embarrassing for us as parents and made us feel like our kids looked like they were out of control. But we knew that that was a risk that they could take that was not likely to have any lasting consequence. Um, offering frequent praise um, and, and, oh wait, sorry, helping your child find creative and expressive outlets, um, talking through decisions step by step with them, providing boundaries and opportunities for negotiating boundaries. Now, what you'll find with boundaries is that they flare emotions. When we can't act out our feelings, we have to feel our feelings. And that's some, why sometimes our children train us to back away from boundaries because we don't want to deal with all the emotion. But the, the boundaries that we experience and the emotion that comes from it is really where we can find gold when it comes to helping our children navigate um, their, their issues with authority, with control, with their impulses and emotion, with peer pressure. Uh, but we won't be able to have those hard conversations if we don't have healthy boundaries with our kids. There's some other things that you can do. Um, one is to uh, utilize family routines to give your uh, child some structure. Family routines are really helpful. They may resist if you haven't had a family night or had family dinners, but there's huge evidence that family structures are really helpful. Um, couple, uh, families who, who have dinner together, um, the, the studies looking at that one behavior are so compelling in terms of the health of the children if they have dinner with their parents on a, on a fairly regular basis. Obviously, that's difficult to navigate with everything that y'all have going on with jobs and after school uh, functions. But if you can manage it even a couple of nights a week, it's gonna really pay off. 
Offering frequent praise and positive rewards. Be a positive role model. Stay connected with your child as much as you can. Open the door for conversation. Talk to them about things that are uncomfortable, like sex. Good, tra good strategy for that is talk about things when you're in the car with them where the, you, they don't have to look at you. They don't have to say anything. They can just hear it and go, mm-hmm. Um, um, opening the door for conversations lets them know that you're not afraid to have difficult conversations. You're not afraid to be uncomfortable and that they can circle back around at, at, a, at a later point. Um, staying connected with them also means being sure that you know what they're up to. You don't have to, to screen everything they do, but if they get exposed to something that shows values that you don't endorse, talk about it. Say, so what do you think about this? What do you think about how, what, your, what your friend posted on social media? Um, try to talk with them about things. If, they're, if their peer is doing something that, that seems bad, um, point it out, but don't um, diss their peer. And don't, uh, don't uh, jump on every thing that happens as a teaching moment. Um, make yourself available, but make yourself uh, approachable. Talk to your children about their developing brain. I think it's good for kids to know that some of the choices they may make are not going to serve them well in the long run. And if they know that uh, a little bit about it, then they can do a better job of navigating it. Okay, so this slide is not just to remind us of the evils of grass or weed. Um, this is to, um, to remind us that the developing brain needs protection. If you think about a lawn, lawns are made to play on, right? To play sports, roll around, um, lay out in the sun. But when a lawn is being established, you have to keep off the grass. And the developing brain really needs some boundaries. We really need to help our kids to um, have some protection so that they can, they can develop in a good way. How do we do that? Um, we have to know that we are made for pleasure. Um, God made our brains to move toward pleasure and away from pain. That's a wonderful thing and a terrible thing. Because um, when your child experiences pain, they're going to look for a way to get away from it. When pleasure is offered, their brain is going to want to go that direction. Um, and so that's something that we have to, we have to look at. I want to take um, just a few moments to look at, um, and I don't, is there a clock anywhere? Because I have no idea. What time do I stop? 7.25, okay, good. So I've got 13 minutes, awesome. So I want to spend bre a little bit of time talking about the teenage brain and pornography and smartphones. Um, the reason for this is that, as I just said, our brains are wired for pleasure and wired to avoid pain. It is normal for us to look for things that will give us relief from pain and that will give us pleasure. Unfortunately, we live in a world that offers um, pain, relief, and pleasure in some very unfortunate ways. When I was younger, there were, a lot, there were teenagers in my age group that smoked. They could um, get relief from pain and get a little pleasure by lighting up a cigarette. Um, there were others that would drive fast um, or get in a sexual relationship. But they couldn't smoke at school, and um, there are certain limits on, on access to vehicles and that kind of thing. But now we have um, devices that are so readily available that will give instant relief from pain and instant pleasure. One of the ways that that happens is through pornography. Um, if... Uh, if we l think about porn, it numbs pain and, cr and, and produces pleasure or provides pleasure. God made sex to be pleasurable. He made the human body to be attractive. Um, but kids are not prepared for sexuality in that way. Unfortunately, we live in a world where there is no protection um, or very little protection for kids being exposed to sexuality way too early. Um, unfortunately... Um, if they uh, it get exposed to sexuality, it turns on a cascade of neurotransmitters in the brain that's very reinforcing. Um, just briefly, some of the neurotransmitters involved in sexuality, um, dopamine, which is, is the reward hormone. It, makes us, it lights up whenever we feel something that gives us our sense of reward. Testosterone, um, attraction and lust. Adrenaline, which gives us excitement. Serotonin, which is a feel-good chemical and oxytocin and vasopressin, which cause a sense of bonding and commitment. Kids often feel disconnected. They often feel anxious. 
They often feel um, uh, threatened by uh, by their peers, and so anything that will that will turn on this cascade of of chemicals is going to be very rewarding and very attractive. Why is porn so alluring? Um, there are three factors that Al Cooper uh, identified. They all start with A. It's accessible, it's affordable, and it's anonymous. This is different than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, um, you'd have to pay for porn. Um, it wasn't uh, on every laptop or every smartphone. And it wasn't anonymous. You'd have to go, go to a, a bookstore and buy it or um, go, go somewhere and, and try to find your, your dad's stash or whatever. But there was no accessibility like it is today. It was hugely different. But early exposure is a, is a key factor. The young heart and mind are extremely vulnerable, and most guys who struggle with porn were exposed before the age of 16. The average age now that, that boys, are, boys and girls are exposed to porn is down to around 9 to 11 years of age. It's horrifying. As a psychiatrist, I know that when you get exposed to pornography that early, it's very likely to stimulate some pathways in the brain that are going to be difficult to navigate maybe for the rest of your life because of that unfortunate um, awareness. Now, if you, if you find out about it and you can help your child navigate it through it and get rid of the shame of it and find some new ways to find pleasure and to deal with their pain, then healing can happen. But many, many children um, are not being um, monitored and are not having a way to navigate that, that uh, accessibility. So uh, monitoring and having controls is really important. Looking at porn is really deadly. Um, I want to look at just real quickly, um, use the word dead as an acrostic, and look at why it's so deadly. Desensitization is one thing, escalation, addiction, and dysfunction and degrading behaviors. So I'm going to run through this um, because I think it's useful, even though it's not the main point of our, of our time together. Um, desensitization happens whenever we... Whenever we see porn, it diminishes our, um, uh, our reaction to um, aberrant behavior, to uh, lack of respect, and even violence. As we stim overstimulate our dopamine receptors in our brain, we lose the ability to enjoy, enjoy simple pleasures. In other words, if you th if think about a man who's looking at pornography, he may lose the ability to enjoy a conversation with his wife because he's wishing she would leave so he could get on the internet and, and look at pornography. Um, our brains are wired for pleasure, but we can wreck our sensitivity. Paul says it in Romans, having lost sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality. This is one of the things that porn does. It also escalates. To get the same intensity, we have to go to the next uh, level of use. The brain uh, needs more, and it also becomes hyper-responsive. We start having craving. If we look at a, uh, an MRI of the brain, someone who looks at porn, um, they will hyper, uh, uh, they'll be hyper alert to any kind of sexual stimuli and light up even more than the normal brain when it comes to pornography. Um, but shame drives addiction, and addiction drives shame. That's why it's so important if you can get your kids to talk about um, sexuality and if they've been exposed to pornography, to get it out in the light. Um, without shame, t letting them know that it's normal to be attracted to the naked body. It's normal to be aroused by sexuality. But that those things, um, it, it, it exposed at an early age, is really damaging. It's like giving your kid a, a, uh, a high-performance vehicle when they're 12 years old. They're not prepared to handle that vehicle. So um, dysfunction, we know that those who use porn habitually report that they are, um, uh, have an increased incidence of erectile dysfunction, difficulty achieving orgasm, and they have a lack of arousal to a real person. They lose interest in real relationships because of the fantasy world of pornography. And as with other compulsive behaviors, executive function declines. That is that prefrontal area um, that we talked about earlier. The connections between the limbic system um, the pleasure systems and that front frontal cortex are diminished, so the person is more and more at the mercy of 
their impulses and less and less able to make good decisions. So the um, other thing is degrading behavior. Um, some people who get addicted to pornography will just go on to, to more uh, casual sex, hookups, um, sexting, other kinds of things like that. Um, fortunately, we can renew the mind. What we set our minds on determines our mindset. We can, if we can uh, help our children to have healthy boundaries, and fortunately there are um, filters you can put on devices. Um, there are uh, some, uh, some programs that will alert you if your child has gone to a site that's a mature rating or highly mature, um, things like Covenant Eyes. I'm a big fan of, of monitoring devices because it's just so powerful that at expecting your kids to not go there um, is really probably very foolish. Um, they just don't have the, the impulse controls to be able to do that. Okay, so um, how are we doing? 720, okay, good. So um, what did you say, 725? Okay, good. So I want to talk briefly about smartphone addiction. And once again, kids have... Um, have at their fingertips something that will give them immediate relief from pain and immediate pleasure. It is like being able to light up a cigarette at any moment. And the slightest um, occurrence of boredom or anxiety or anger, many uh, children and many adults will unconsciously pick up their phone. If they feel uncomfortable, if they feel sad, if they feel angry, they get on the internet. They look something up. They may think they're just having a you know, urge to look something up or to check Facebook or whatever, but we're using our phones as a coping strategy. Like lighting up a cigarette, people who have a coping strategy that keeps them from having to feel their feelings, they stunt their emotional growth. Um, this is a huge problem. Um, the average hours a day spent on far smartphones, 6.3 hours. 60% um, of teens admit to an addiction to their smartphones. One in five teens check their smartphone in the middle of the night. An amazing number of, of young adults sleep with their smartphone or have it within easy reach. It's the last thing they look at when they go to bed, the first thing they look at in the morning. Teens check their phone 74 times a day every 19 minutes. One in three teens send 100 texts per day. Isn't that incredible? Um, here are some signs of smartphone addiction. Because we're running low on time, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are some things that you can actually look at to determine whether or not um, you may be dealing with, a, with an ad actual addiction. Um, anxiety and depression is a huge problem as a result of not enough interactions um, between real people to stimulate dopamine. As I said before, the more screen time, the more the risk of unhappiness, depression, and anxiety. Um, some people will have com computer vision syndrome, um, problems with their uh, with eye strain and blurred vision. Um, we know that screen time interrupts sleep patterns. Um, when if you sleep with the phone on or near the bed, um, the artificial light can damage uh, the melatonin signals. But it, we also think there's something else going on that it's not just melatonin. That just the presence of the phone is actually um, creating some arousal in, in the child that keeps their sleep from being as helpful as possible. People who use uh, smartphones a lot tend to suffer from shorter attention span, which is a big problem for kids. Um, what parents are doing, um, setting text limits, um, setting times or uh, time of day limits, and checking phone content. These are all things that are great to do. So how do you help teens kick the smartphone addiction? Um, these are a few of the things. You can create um, no phone zones. Um, if you're eating dinner, everybody should put their devices away. Um, certain activities, um, just set the phones aside. Reclaim family dinners, I mentioned before. Monitor call phone activity. Designate access periods. Forbid driving and texting. And seek help if you need it. What we're talking about here really is that, that our brains need to learn how to deal with life um, in, a, in a healthy way. Relationship is the way to go. The sad thing is that anything we can control will ultimately control us. If I have something I can turn to that predictably relieves my boredom, my anxiety, my depression, um, then I'm going to turn to that more and more often, whether it's alcohol or a smartphone, pornography, or food. 
anything that can moderate my emotional state and give me a predictable response can be my go-to strategy. That's a problem. Relationships don't always give us the result that we wish for. They're not as predictably helpful as pornography or a smartphone. That's why we don't go to them unless we have to. If we don't limit our kids' access to these other activities, they won't come to us and they won't go to God. We don't get a warm fuzzy every time we pray to God, like we do when we turn on our smartphone. God is not going to be controlled because he does not want to control us. He doesn't want our response from him to be so predictable that we're addicted to him in the way we would be addicted to porn or a smartphone. God wants relationship to be at the heart of your uh, family, he wants to be at the heart of your, your relationship with your kids and your relationship with him. So think about the, the, hum, the human brain um, as, a, uh, as an organ meant for love. God wants you to, um, to learn to love him, to love your children, for them to love you, and that shepherding your child's brain, um, creating healthy boundaries, um, encouraging them to do healthy activities will help their brain to grow, help them to prune off the bad and stimulate the good. Um, I hope that um, that's helpful to you. Um, there's so much more that I would love to share with you about the brain, but um, we'll get a chance to do a little Q&A later, and I'm so grateful that you invited me, Jill, and, and thanks for listening. Well, welcome back, everyone. It is about that time. Time is flying, it feels like. So if y'all will make your way back to your seats, I am going to introduce uh, the second portion of our evening. So we are going to welcome up Pastor Dan Slagle and Becky Slagle, who are raising four teenage students of their own. They have four between the ages of 15 and 19. So they are able to speak from a pastoral perspective and parenting perspective. And I think you will find that they parent with honesty, with insight, and just have great tips um, down the road with teenagers. So they will have a lot to share for us. So please welcome with me, Dan and Becky Slagle. Thank you, Jill, very much. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> that is a terrifying introduction. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I cannot tell you how humbled, truly, we are to be here tonight, standing before you to talk about parenting. Uh, it's just the most audacious thing in the world. I think anybody who has been a parent for more than a month understands we don't know what we're doing. We are just uh, figuring it out as we go along, doing uh, what we can as we learn. Becky and I have been blessed uh, to be the beneficiaries of so many wise people. Uh, I, I count among our greatest blessings that we've had access all along the way to people who have done it well, who are doing it well, who have made them, themselves available to us, and uh, we have taken advantage of that over and over and over. I'll, I'll offer that as my first tip. Um, if you see somebody who seems to be doing it well, don't hesitate to go and say, hey, could we have coffee? Could we have lunch? Uh, let, let me learn from what, what you're doing. By God's grace, we have managed to do a few things right. Um, but because of our brokenness, we've also made plenty of mistakes along the way, too. Um, as I thought about the fact that we would be speaking to you tonight on this topic, as we were leaving, I gathered the girls together and told them I would give each one of them $20 if they wouldn't do anything stupid for at least a week. And perhaps that would lend a little credibility to what uh, I'll be saying tonight. In my portion, uh, my goal is to share with you really uh, some very broad notions, principles, things that Becky and I have tried to implement in the now nearly 20 years that we've been parenting. Uh, Becky 
on the other hand, is going to get a little more specific. Um, you can think of mine as the 30,000 foot view, hers is more down in the trenches, and I think that actually reflects our respective roles as parents. Uh, as we were leaving, our youngest, Vivian, looked at me and said, so are you speaking to? As a matter of fact, I am. Um, so let's take a minute and pray and we'll, we'll jump in. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for FSM and for the very proactive uh, manner in which they are not only working with our kids, but helping us to, um, to be a blessing to our children so that they may be a blessing to the world. Pray now that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in the few minutes that I have with you, I just want to share with you four principles that Becky and I have worked diligently to implement. I wish I could say we were batting a thousand with every single one of them, but um, I can say we've we have worked hard to be consistent with them. And the first of those is the idea that Becky and I were a family first before the kids ever came along. Um, they, they are the intruders, so to speak. We, we had a, a family, and they became a part of it. And one day... In a manner of speaking, they will no longer be a part of it, at least in the, the immediate sort of way that they are now. Um, it's easy to take the mindset when kids come along that everything has to change. And we're going to totally reorient and redesign the way that we're doing life. And obviously, to some degree, there will be change. It would be foolish to think that there was no change. Flexibility is required, as a wide, wise person said to me once. Uh, Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Um, but we have not built our family around our kids. We were already a family. We have tried not to be a child-centric home. Our children obviously have a, a prominent role to play in the life of our family, and they do get a lot of uh, attention and time and love and money along the way. But uh, Becky and I have kept ourselves at the center of the home and our relationship at the center of the home. It amazes me from time to time when I see parents who not only have uh, changed as individuals, but in some ways have become helpless in the face of this hurricane called a child. It's as though they lose their sense of who they are and uh, their sense of authority, their responsibility. We talk about what in the world is going on in a kid's mind, and Paul did such a good job of, of teaching us about the incredible pace of development that's going on in their heads as they grow. That just underscores for me the need for stability. There needs to be a place in their life where they know things are going to be the same. I'm not going to come home and it's going to be this way one day and another way the next. But I can count on mom and dad to be stable influences in my life. We were at a folks' home several years ago, and uh, they also were the parents of teenagers, and there was uh, a bit of a uh, discussion, if you will, between the dad and their son, and uh, I was just astonished at the complete lack of respect that the son showed toward his father, and the language that he used toward his father, and his dad did not respond to that in, in any way. The kid just sort of stomped off. And the dad turned and, and looked at me and said, Kids, what can you do? I thought to myself, uh, You want me to show you? <laughs> I got a few things I'd like to do right now. 
Um, this sense of stability that children need, of course, is needed from the time they're born until they leave, but it really, I think, comes into play in a serious sort of way during the teenage years because this is where they are capable of making decisions. We're not telling them everything about their life. They're deciding some things, and they have access to information like they never have before, and they have tra access to transportation, and they have access to relationships that we don't have anything to do with. We might not even be aware of some of them. That underscores uh, what Paul was saying earlier about the importance of routines. There is this place in the world that I have. They may not be able to articulate it and probably won't ever come home and say, Mom, Dad, thanks for making this a routine place for me. But inside, they, they need it. And somewhere deep inside, they know that they need it. And um, the degree to which we can remain a united front as a couple, and they understand that they're not at the center of the universe, that mom and dad are at the center of this home and God is in between them, I think that helps kids have that sense of stability and routine. My sister uh, has a daughter, Claire, who now is uh, grown and married and doing well on her own. But I remember when Claire was a teenager, I called my sister just to catch up on things. And in the course of our conversation, I said, well, how's Claire doing? And my sister said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? She said, well, Claire doesn't live here anymore. What? What on earth? So, oh, her body is here. I have no idea who is inhabiting it at the moment. It's not the little Claire that we've known all these years. Their lives are crazy and chaotic. I'm, I'm sure you can reflect on your teenage years and remember the uh, indecisiveness, the lack of impulse control, uh, the incredible fear and concern about what your peers are thinking, all of that stuff just swirling around all the time. They need a place in this world that is going to be stable. So, point number two, Becky and I uh, have tried to be parents first with an eye towards being their friends later. In addition to stability, kids really need authority. They need boundaries, as Paul was saying. They need to know there are places they can go and places they cannot go. As our girls have grown up, we have worked very hard to stay in the role of parenting so that one day when they're grown and gone, they will want to be our friends and we will want to be their friends. But if we start that friendship aspect too soon, it's probably going to damage the possibility for a healthy friendship when they become adults because that's not, not what they need from us right now. They need us to be their parents. When I was a kid, I remember there was a girl in my youth group whose parents divorced and for some reason, I, I looking back on it, I really am not exactly sure why. Perhaps she was just terribly lonely. Her mom really tried to become one of the kids with us. I mean, she was there for activities and uh, sort of acted like us. And um, I noticed how quickly the daughter began to lose respect for her and how disobedience was no big deal for her anymore because mom had surrendered her authority. She had given that up. And now the daughter looked at her as, oh, well, you're just one of my peers. And so I can treat you how I treat my peers. I can talk to you the way I talk to my peers. Uh, we've lost that sense of, no, I'm, I'm the child and you are the parent. With four girls, uh, as you might imagine, you know, I'm uh, pretty much swimming in a sea of estrogen at our house. Definitely a 
uh, minority in a sorority. And I'm ever so thankful that I've got Becky to help me navigate these treacherous waters of teenage girl years because uh, I, I have one sister but three brothers. So it was pretty much a male-dominated home that I grew up in. And so I'm, boy, I've learned a lot over the last several years. Um, I've learned that the communication, the natural communication gift that girls have can be a wonderful thing. It can also be a deadly thing. And uh, whereas boys, I think, when they are upset or mad, tend to sulk and maybe go off and try to ignore you or forget, uh, boy, girls, phew, they know how to get those words in there. Uh, they know how to zing. They know how to do the, the eye roll and the stomp off and all um, we have had to reinforce over and over, we're not your friends. We are your parents. One of these days, we're going to be your friends. And we're going to have a great time getting together as adults. But that's not where we are. And so in this season of your life, you're going to have to do what we say. And you are going to speak to us appropriately. You're going to demonstrate respect. You're not going to talk to us like you talk to your friends. Of course, they don't always like to hear that. But I find that our home is much more peaceful when we maintain our roles appropriately. And I find that the girls uh, not only get along with us better, they get along with each other better. When everybody knows the boundaries, when everybody knows the rules, relationships work so much more smoothly. Number three, uh, we've always tried to keep lines of communication wide open. I mean, how else will we know what's going on in their brains if we don't? We can't just let them go off and do their thing and us go off and do our thing. No, that it is vital that to whatever degree it is possible, those lines of communication are open. What does that mean? Well, for one thing, no topic is off limits. We talk about everything at our house. That's not the way it was in the home that I grew up in. Now, nobody ever said, my mom and dad never said, okay, we do talk about this, but we don't talk about these things. Just sort of intuited. Probably not going to talk about that much. We'll talk about work and sports and school uh, but relationships and conflict, I bet Dad does not want to talk about that. Well, we've decided our home would be different and uh, that we would give the girls the opportunity to, to talk to us and bring things to us. And we've discovered that they take advantage of that opportunity. They're not shy uh, when they have concerns about things. Um, What's necessary in that whole equation is that we have to make ourselves available for that. And to reiterate, Paul, again, the, the, the car is an excellent place, a captive audience. You know. Sometimes all you get is a grunt as a response. Um, but when something is really going on deep inside, if they have understood from the get-go Oh, no, this is a place where I can talk, and this is a human being to whom I can talk who is really interested in what I have to say and who cares about what I have to say and who's not going to wag a finger every time I tell them about a struggle that I have. They're probably going to be willing to talk to us. I will admit that sometimes we have to force ourselves to listen. Sometimes they are saying things that are so stupid. I just want to say, are you kidding me? That's the dumbest thing I have ever heard. Don't do that. Especially with girls, don't do that. It, it, yeah, don't let your face say it either. That, that, that's a good, good word. Uh, We've trained ourselves to, oh, 
wow, yeah, that must have been hard. I'm sure that was really tough. Hmm, yeah, yeah, wow. <laughs> and we have tried to be proactive in initiating conversation. Now, this is much easier for Becky than it is for me. Uh, I, I am an introvert. I gain my energy from being away from people. That's why on Sundays I go home and collapse right after church. Uh, all of you have just been draining me all morning long. But Becky is an extrovert. And that's why when we get home from church, she's like, ready to do something, ready to have fun. Uh, and her communication skills are superior to mine as well. And to some degree, the girls are just more comfortable now that they're older talking to her about certain things than, than they are with me. Uh, but the larger principle is we've kept those lines open, and we have never, uh, I'm not going to say never, we have tried very hard not to communicate. We don't talk about that, or I'm not interested in what you have to say. I've tried to do just the opposite. And then finally, number four, we have admitted our fallibility to them. We have wanted to let them know that less than perfect is normal. If I'm seeing any common denominator in teenagers today, it is this drive for achievement and perfection and got to get in the best schools and get on the best teams and, and be the best looking and get the most likes on Facebook and, you, you know, higher and higher and higher. Where are they allowed to be normal? Where are they allowed to be what they truly are, broken, sinful human beings? And so Becky and I have not um, tried to present ourselves as uh, infallible in any way. We try to be very quick to say to them, I was wrong and I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? That, that's another thing that did not happen much in my home of origin. Um, my dad was never wrong. Uh, he never felt the need to say he was sorry. And I remember as a child feeling that uh, dissonance, like that was wrong, and he should be sorry. But I guess when you're dad, you, you don't have to. You just get to make the rules. And that created a lot of frustration for me as a child, created some real anger issues in my life. And so one of the decisions that uh, we made that we would do differently than our parents did is when we blew it, we would sit down and say, that was wrong. I should not have lost my temper. I should not have yelled at you. I should not have whatever the case was. That has made us very approachable as parents knowing that we don't always have to be right and that protecting our position as parents doesn't involve lying but owning when we have been wrong. Um, we try to laugh at ourselves when we mess up. I think that's a wonderful life skill. When someone can um, have the security and the uh, self-knowledge to the point that they are able to see that, that was pretty dumb what I just did, wasn't it? You know, I, I can own that. I, I can laugh at me too. Uh, nobody has to go around snickering behind dad's back because dad's probably laughing before they are about the dumb thing that he has done. It enables them, I think, to accept their own fallibility. And they're not holding themselves to an unachievable standard when they see that messing up is a part of life. But owning it and apologizing for it is as well. Those are the four thoughts that I had. I hope they are helpful to you and speak into your situation. Uh, now, according to Vivian, our youngest, you're going to hear from the one who really should have been up here all along. I'm, 
it's okay. I'm actually going to use the stand. Yeah, yeah, I'll use it. Well, you've had the brilliance of Paul Looney, the wisdom of Dan Slagle, and now you're stuck with me. So, Vivian lies. There are many of you standing out there who um, probably have more to offer and more to say than I do, but I'm going to give you what I've got, and I hope it will be helpful. If you can go to the first slide there, Chris. I asked Dan exactly what I was supposed to talk about tonight, and he said, in 10 or 12 minutes, just share some practical tips on parenting, things we've done right. I said, I can share that in one or two minutes. <laughs> I'm thankful you did not ask me to share what we've done wrong. Um, parenting's hard, y'all. If you're not deeply into the teenage years yet, it, it's a handful. Uh, but at FaithBridge, we do real people, real life. So I'll share a little about our adventures so far. Um, during our first year of marriage, Dan and I had the opportunity to go to Asbury, Kentucky, where he was in his um, Doctor of Ministry program. We were there with 15 other families who all of the husbands were in the D-Men program getting their degree, most of the wives were either working or home raising children, but Dan and I were the most newly wed of that group of families. We had been married all of three months when we moved to Wilmore, and we knew nothing. Well, we knew nothing about marriage. We knew even less than nothing about parenting. But we realized we'd been placed in this perfect experiment because these 15 families that we basically lived sort of communally with in this 15 apartment complex all had children, ranging in age from in utero to teenagers. And we knew we were going to do life with these people for a year. And so we thought, how perfect to watch these Christian parents and see what are they doing right, what are they doing wrong. And we saw some fantastic examples of right and we saw some amazingly frightening examples of wrong and so by the time we left there at the end of that year we too were expecting our firstborn and so we thought wow this is incredible the things we've learned well that group of families got together and they gave us a shower of advice on parenting <clears throat> and the advice that we got that hit home the most with me Oh, and I didn't think to ask which one page is down. Oh, it's already there. Was, it, and still rings true today, is if it's the easy thing to do in parenting, it's probably the wrong thing to do. And that has stuck with us over the years. Parenting is the hardest, most challenging, least appreciated, and most rewarding thing I've ever done. Have you ever had a job where you had no experience, no training, you weren't allowed to quit, and people's lives were at stake. <laughs> now, I'm a nurse practitioner in the NICU at Texas Children's, and I have been for 25 years, and I'm responsible every day for someone's little one-pound baby and keeping them alive. And I find that job a hundred times easier than parenting my own teenagers. It's a handful, but it's a privilege, and I can't think of a way that we are given a bigger privilege as Christians than to raise up godly children who can go out and impact their world for Christ. Well, if you fast forward 20 years, as Dan said, there he is, the minority in the sorority. We are in the throes of parenting. This is his birthday a few weeks ago, and that's our four girls. 15 to 19 years old, and they are a challenge. They're wonderful, but they're a challenge. Um, they would tell you that we're old, and we're old-fashioned in our parenting. And if you look at parenting styles, we lean much more towards the children should be seen and not heard than the everybody gets a trophy. Um, it's tough being a sleigh girl, as they call it. Um, as Dan said, your kids were born into a family. We were already there before they got there, and we're determined to still be there when they're gone. Uh, it's very easy, especially at these ages, to get so tied up in taking care of them and doing for them that sometimes I roll over in the bed and think, who is that? It, it's busy and it's hard. 
I read a great book a couple of years ago from the former freshman admission dean at Stanford University, Julie Lykoff Hames, called How to Raise an Adult. And I highly recommend it to you. It's actually not in your book at the back. I didn't think to hand that in to these guys here. Um, but the title tells you everything, How to Raise an Adult. So we talk about raising our children. Do you want to raise a child <laughs> or do you want to raise an adult? I think we all want to turn out adults, not children. And she has a very good quote in the book <clears throat> that I'll read to you. As the safety-conscious, academic achievement-focused, self-esteem-promoting, checklisted childhood that has been commonplace since the mid-1980s and in many communities has become the norm, robbed kids of the chance to develop into healthy adults. What will become of young adults who look accomplished on paper but seem to have a hard time making their way in the world without the constant involvement of their parents? She found as the dean at Stanford, where what's their acceptance rate? About 4 or 5% right now. So you've got to be perfect score on the SAT, perfect essays, perfect everything to get in. She found that these kids could not take care of themselves. When they'd come into her office for something and she'd ask a question, they'd say, well, let me call my mom and I'll get back to you. Because they'd been so scripted and so controlled and so helicopter parented that they didn't know how to be grown up. Most of us are painfully aware. Like we've said, parenting is hard. But like Dan said, uh, and one of, my, one of my fears of being up here today was we didn't really, the three of us, coordinate this at all. We each had our separate things we were saying. So my big fear as I sat here listening to Paul tonight was, oh, what if something he says completely contradicts something I'm going to say? He's the expert. I'm just a mom. Praise the Lord, God was on my side. There wasn't anything that was like totally off key there. But like Dan said, uh, our, child, our home is not child-centric. And we feel like that if right now we can be the parent of our child, not their promoter, not their friend, then later one day we'll look back and think, I want to be friends with that person. That's a cool person, not what a brat. So towards that end, uh, I'm going to give you my top ten list of parenting advice. Of course, I guess it um, goes without saying that the assumption is that you're raising a child in a Christ-centered home, that you're praying for your children, that you're praying with your children. Those things taken care of. Here's my top ten plus one because I couldn't narrow it down. <laughs> so, number one, practice what you preach. I was so sad a couple of weeks ago when one of my daughters came to me and said, Mom, I think I had an encounter with a drunk parent. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I saw this person, and she acted like so friendly toward me, and she hugged on me, and oh, hey, how are you doing? And talked to me, and just carried on and on, and was really close in my face, and I think she was drunk. And this was a parent that I know, and a Christian parent, um, Parents, we've got to practice what we preach. I can't tell my teenager, don't go out and get drunk and go out with my friends and get drunk. It, you just can't. I can't say gossiping is wrong and have my daughter walk in with me on the phone saying, would you get over how she was acting at church? We can't do it. We've got to hold ourselves accountable first. Uh, and I don't stand up here saying I've got it all under control. Like Dan said, we're all sinners. But I've got to work on my own little red wagon before I can preach it to my children. Second, I would say, date your spouse. It's hard to maintain your marriage when you're raising teenagers. You're busy, busy, busy. You're chasing after everybody's schedules. Um, we, we do better at it at times, and then we get into patterns where we're not doing as great at making time to have a date night, you know. I know Ken and Suzanne Worland for years have had every Monday night's date night, period. They don't do anything else on Monday night. Uh, we used to do couch time when they were little. They knew when dad came into work, mom and dad are sitting on the couch. Get lost. Don't talk to us. Don't bring your issues. We're reconnecting at the end of the day. Go away. If you're a single parent, take time for yourself. Let them know, I'm going to do something for me. I've got to be healthy before I can take care of you. Present a united front. Dan brought this up. My girls know if I say no, don't sneak around and ask dad because he's going to after 20 years of parenting, say, did you already talk to mom about this? 
And if the answer was no, then the answer is no. Now, behind the scene, we may totally disagree. And I th <laughs> think about one time we got kind of caught in this. Georgia, our oldest, when she was 17, wanted to go down. I can't remember the name of the place. It's a music venue, also known as a bar. But underage kids can get in. Yeah, whatever. It has a bar and it serves alcohol and they play music. <laughs> whatever you want to call that. Are you seeing where we went on this decision? <laughs> so she came to me and she and several of her junior in high school friends wanted to drive to downtown and listen to this band. And I said, no, it's a bar. You're not, I mean, it, it's a school night. It's a bar. You're 17. Nope, not going. Well, she went and asked dad and he said, okay. What? And his point was, Becky, a year from now, she can go and do whatever she wants. Give her some freedom. Let her figure it out. La, 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 la. Well, I prayed, and God canceled that concert. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> totally serious. Totally serious. She came in so bummed from school. They canceled the concert. I guess you prayed. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I did. Most of the time, we present a very united front. Uh, teach love, forgiveness, and mercy. We love our girls. We tell them every day, I love you. We hug them every day. We weren't, or I wasn't raised that way completely. I had a dad who I knew he loved me, but he maybe said it twice in his whole life. Um, we make a point of telling that, saying that. <clears throat> we also make a point of forgiving, like he said, and seeking forgiveness. And one thing we've taught the girls is, when someone comes to you and says, I'm sorry, Will you forgive me? You don't say, it's okay. No, it's not okay. It is not okay. You did the wrong thing. What you say is, I forgive you. And so we're pretty sticklery about that. But then also extending mercy. I mess up. They mess up. We try to extend mercy. Paul touched on this. I, I can't say enough the damage I've seen in young girls' lives from the whole comparison games of social media. Um, one of our daughters really struggled with this, and we took her phone away completely. First of all, we're the mean parents. You don't get a smartphone until you're 16 and you're driving a car because then I feel like you do need a map and you do need to be able to find things and find your way around. So you don't get one until then, and there's certain things you just can't do on it. You can't take it to bed at night. It has to stay downstairs and on the charger. Now, will they sneak it up there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but... I feel like, as far as the Internet is concerned, we all have Wi-Fi in our homes now, and I'm shocked at the number of kids who come over and say, can you give me your password to your Wi-Fi? No, I can't. <laughs> That's why I have a password on it. Um, I threaten my children, don't ever let me hear you ask an adult in their home for the password to their Wi-Fi. It wouldn't be password protected if they wanted you on it. Um, keep, keep them safe. They're not smart enough to keep themselves safe. Our daughter struggled so much with that. We took it away, and she was the one who came and said to me, I can't tell you how much better I feel without Snapchat. You know, nobody posts on Snapchat. My mother screamed and called me an ugly name today, and we had a huge fight. They just don't. They post the good, the best. Ooh, we're beautiful. Um, it's so damaging to our young girls. Let them fail. That's hard. It hurts to watch your child mess up. Um, it starts with the little things, the text, Mom, I forgot my lunch. The temptation is, I don't want them to be hungry all day. They won't be able to pay attention. They'll get in trouble because they'll be bored. I'm just going to run it over there to the school. No, let them be hungry. They'll remember their lunch tomorrow. Have I always done this? No, no, you know. I know you've got that B in math and you forgot to take this paper to hand it in, and I know you can get an A if I just take that paper up there for you so you can get it handed in. Let them fail at the small things early so that they learn later and don't fail at the things that really matter. Um, and I'll cry when I tell this one. Dan's mom, who's the wisest woman in the world, um, I was bemoaning to her once on the phone about one of our daughters and she was going through a hard time and somebody was really hurting her and I just wanted to go and you know beat the person up and tell their parent and fix it all and she said, it's really hard to watch the world knock the corners off your child, isn't it? I said, it is. And she said, but that's how they become well-rounded. And she's right. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Eat dinner together. 
This has always been a big thing in our home, probably because I like to cook. So we do have dinner together often. That's just a part of what we do, and it's a fantastic time for us to talk. Um, poor Dan suffers at many of these meals because there's usually five conversations going on at once around the table. Da, 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 and, and we women hear every one of them, don't we? You know exactly what everybody's saying. And Dan finally just sort of <sighs> leans back in his chair and doesn't say anything sometimes because he'll say, I can't understand what anybody's saying. <laughs> um, I, I don't understand that. I hear every word that all four of them are saying. Teach them life skills. Do not let your child leave your home not knowing how to wash their own laundry. <laughs> I feel strongly about this one. It's simple stuff. They need to, know how, need to know how to cook a meal or two. They need to know how to call the dentist and make an appointment for six months from now to get their teeth cleaned. Um, this is the helicoptering. that it, It's just easier, isn't it, moms? Just do it yourself. I'll just call the dentist. Your appointment is on July 20th. Go. Make them do it. I can't tell you how, as we realized we weren't doing a good job of that, when you'd say to the girls, we'll make a phone call. No, I have to call somebody? If they can't text it, they can't do it. So make them pick up the phone, make them make a phone call, make them make eye contact and talk to a person. Serve others. If you're at FaithBridge, you're in a perfect place that makes this super easy for you to teach your child. Be on a serve group with them, serve in kingdom clubs, serve in the parking lot. And then one thing that's been super important in our girls' lives is the road. Student ministry and now the church at Wide does uh, mission trips every summer. And our girls, Georgia served this past year, one of our oldest served this past year as an intern on the road after her, I forget now, eighth or ninth road trip over the summer. It's an incredible place for them to go and learn how to reach out, help other people in need. And if there is a better way to teach gratefulness in a child, I don't know what it is, because they see that it's not about what you get. It's about what you're doing for other people. Um, the old adage, it's better to give than to receive, really comes true when they're on the road. Talk a lot and listen even more. And this one does fall to me probably a lot more often than Dan, especially now with teenage girls. But we have always told them there's nothing you can't come and tell us, not a single thing. And there have been times that I have had to everything inside me to not go, you did what? Wait, or you don't really believe that, do you? Um, a friend of mine, I don't think she's here tonight, said that her son told her at one point when she said, you never tell me anything, he said, well, if you wouldn't overreact about everything I do tell you, I'd tell you a lot more. So learn the poker face and learn. And, and we've had our moments of things that they come that make my heart sink. And I think the end of the world must be coming. But if you can just, okay, let's talk about that. And not have the, either for me, meltdown in tears of, oh, your life is coming to an end. Or the anger of, how could you be so stupid? Um, then they will tell you things that you wish they wouldn't sometimes. But as hard as it might be to hear, Mom, I think I'm pregnant, or Mom, I think my girlfriend's pregnant, would you rather them come and tell you, or would you rather find it out when she goes into labor? I want to know these things up front. I want to help my child navigate good decisions and bad decisions. So being available and listening I think is super important. Um, I know, again, Dan, parenting all girls, has felt the pain of this. I think about once when one of our girls started her period. I was at work. He was at church. She stayed home because she didn't feel good. We found out later why she didn't feel good. But <laughs> when Dan got home from church and opened the door, she met him at the door and said, Dad, Dad, I started my period. <laughs> and Dan said, Ugh. Did you call your mom? <laughs> so be warned. If you make it okay for them to tell you everything, moms and dads, they will tell you everything to the point that you don't know what to do sometimes. Along that same line, and my final bonus point, um, it takes a village. Again, if you're at FaithBridge, you're at the perfect place to find a village and invest in it. My girls know, and I can look around this room and see Amanda, Jill, Kathleen, 
my girls know if you can't talk to me about something, here's a woman that you can go to, Georgia, who will hear anything you have to say. If there's ever a time that you don't feel like you can tell me, there's a godly woman, and there's a godly woman, and there's a godly woman who will listen to you, who won't come rat to your mom, but will help you navigate and know what to do. That's what small groups are about here, having a community of friends that will parent with you. I love that. <laughs> that will parent with you and will help your children to see you're not the only one. Because often you are going to be labeled the mean mom. Nobody else is parent. Da, da, da. Uh, go ask Amanda. See what she tells you. Because you have a community that helps you to know. The teen years are full of challenges, and, and actually, I was going to tell the same story Dan told about our niece, Claire. Um, bits, my sister-in-law did say, it's like an alien. It's like we had this sweet little daughter, and then all of a sudden, there's this snarling, spitting thing coming out of her room that no one knows how this happened. It's like overnight. Um, just today, our youngest one had one of those moments, and they know this story about their knee, their cousin. And so when she came out of her room, after being sent to her room the third time, uh, when she came out of the room, I said, oh, did the aliens return you? She's like, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> but it's true. In their teenage years, they go towards the dark side. But eventually, it's amazing, they come back out. And our older two, we're beginning to see it. It's like... That sweet little person I used to know is, is coming back again. But it's during these, t these years that they're practicing being grown up. It's the reason we're butting heads is because they're developing that independence. And like Paul said, they're trying to separate from us. And if you cling and hang on to the control, they can't do that. And they can't get away and be the little adult they're trying to be. Um, you know, the only thing that's worse than your child growing up and leaving home and not needing you on a day-to-day -day basis is your adult child never growing up, Amen. never leaving your home and always needing you on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not what any of us want. So guide them as they try to figure this out, but don't squelch that independence. They need it. They need to separate from us. <clears throat> and when it gets to the point where you think you can't stand them another minute and where you think your house will never be clean again and you'll never be able to have a moment of peace and quiet, moms at least, I can say, hang this sign in the kitchen, go get a latte, and go sit at Target for about two hours and you'll feel better. <laughs> Thank you. Well, a big thank you to the Slagles. Uh, let's get everyone back up stage, and uh, we'll do a quick Q&A session to wrap it tonight. So uh, if you have any questions, we'll take them in a minute. I'll give you the grace of an extra couple of seconds to think as you're processing, and I'll uh, ask a question or two of my own. Oh. Okay. Here, should we slide this back out of the way? Okay. As we get settled back in here. Sorry. Uh, so first, uh, Paul, what I want to know is you talked a lot about the relationship between teenagers and the pleasure centers of their brain and how uh, their brain runs towards pleasure. How can we encourage teenagers to run towards healthy outlets to experience pleasure? Like if that's what their brain wants to do, how do we channel that for good? Well, for, for me, one of the things that we felt like for, when our boys were teenagers, we wanted them to be surrounded by peers who would encourage healthy activities, um, that they, they could have fun um, with a, a healthy peer group. And so for me, that our, our number one priority in finding a church was a place where our kids wanted to go, um, where they felt engaged. Um, finding ways that they can find pleasure through learning sports, music, uh, learning some, some skill that they, they love, going to camp. Find things that are fun for them that you can encourage. Um, obviously, we, I mean, God made us for pleasure. The, the Garden of Eden, Eden means pleasure. And that's what God designed us for. Uh, but it's, it's guarding them from unhealthy pleasures. Um, some of the unhealthy pleasures are the easiest to come by. 
and the most predictable. It's more difficult to find pleasure in a real relationship than find pleasure in a virtual relationship. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of guiding them and toward the healthy pleasures are setting boundaries up so they can't have unhealthy pleasures. If you look at the first psalm, you know, David starts out with boundaries. He says, blessed are those who do not walk in the way of the wicked or sit in the seat of scoffers, whatever. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. We find delight in the good things once we limit the bad things. And um, that, that one, one of the things that you all brought out so well in your talk is, is finding ways to parent well and to set healthy limits so, that your, parent, so your kids stay on the path. Excellent. Uh, taking a little bit of a different direction, uh, recently uh, our students uh, and really kids were exposed to uh, a Netflix series, uh, 13 Reasons Why, which kind of uh, brought to our collective consciousness this idea of anxiety and depression and suicide and uh, became real to a lot of us that our students really uh, deal with this, whether they're personally affected by anxiety, depression, or suicidal thoughts. Uh, or that they have friends who are experiencing these things. What's the uh, link between uh, the psychology of the teenage brain that you talked about earlier and our students experiencing anxiety and depression? One of the things I mentioned was that, that the part of your brain that responds emotionally is hypersensitive hyper to things that happen. So uh, even something that seems relatively minor can be crushing to a teenager. So that's part of why they can feel like their world is over when they get bullied or, or uh, slurred on social media or whatever. So that being aware of that is, is part of it. But I think also realizing that they don't have good coping strategies. And if they don't know how to talk themselves through those feelings, um, they're at the mercy of them. And so often because they don't have um, the long view, um, they don't see a future. They don't see something that, that good that can come out of this. So being able to, to do some of the things that Becky and Dan said is creating a space where they can they have someone they can go to when they're in distress. I think it's also important to normalize um, those kinds of, of uh, feelings, to normalize anxiety um, and depression, but to be able to, to help them think through the consequences of, of things like suicide. Um, because if, 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 you, if your child thinks that suicide is my ticket out of pain, then that's going to look pretty, uh, pretty attractive at times. Mm. But we help them to think through that, you know, what is it, what, what does suicide mean for someone? A asking them to kind of play the movie in terms of what they're considering can really be helpful for them as well. Um, I, I, I think it's especially troublesome when, um, when teenagers see things like 13 Reasons or have a suicide at their school, and they don't have help navigating that and realizing that, that they can be compassionate toward a person who, who makes a bad choice um, without lowering their own uh, tendency, uh, the, the, the threshold, that they would actually engage in the same activity. We know that that's very common. Just like if you have a, a divorce in a family, it, it lowers the threshold for the next divorce. If you have a suicide, it lowers the threshold. It's extremely important to address that. Hmm. Excellent. So, Dan and Becky, given that uh, virtually all of our students are affected or related to this in some way, what's your take on uh, anxiety and depression? Uh, it, it's, I can only speak as a mother of girls. I don't know the effect it has on boys, but I think in 50 years, <laughs> psychiatrists will look back and go, oh my gosh. Look what happened to this generation that was constantly exposed to this comparison game of social media. Um, it's okay to be the mean parent. It's okay to say, delete Snapchat. Will they hate you? Will they scream? Will, will they maybe even say, I hate you? Yep, yep. But would you rather have them alive? Would you rather have them not struggling with panic attacks and depression and anxiety? And I'm not saying the internet is evil and you have to get it out of your home. But I think Paul made it clear that the addictive nature of it, I mean, how, how many of us can now reach within a foot of our body and hold up a smartphone? It, it's just rampant. We've got to protect them. They cannot protect themselves. We cannot protect ourselves. I mean, my phone's with me all the time. So even more so, you got to be the bad guy. 
I would add to that, um, help your children deal with FOMO, fear of missing out. It's real. When I was a kid, no cell phones obviously, there were probably a million things that went on that I never knew about. But I didn't have any anxiety over it because I didn't know about it. Kids now are so incredibly connected with each other that it, it would drive anybody insane to be aware of so much activity and constantly monitoring. Am I included in this? Do they think about me for that? Do they want me to come to this? Are they snubbing me for that? Uh, I would probably be an anxious mess too if that was the basis of my existence. And of course, kids are all about how am I doing? Am I accepted? Am I a part of this? Am I, am I liked? And so helping your kids engage in activities other than those that make them aware of what everybody else is doing, I think it's a good idea. And talking about this with them. I mean, we spend lots of time in our home kind of giggling about, well, yes, I see that she posted that picture where she looks very voluptuous and gorgeous. She didn't post that she and her mother just had a knockdown drag out, um, putting it into reality. Because for them, everything they see on the internet is real. And we know, because our brains are different, it's not real. It's not real. One of the things that we, we've learned in recent years that uh, what used to be considered the gold standard for uh, psychological health was we thought was self-esteem. And generations of parents tried to give their children good health esteem. But now it turns out that self-esteem actually has an ugly underbelly, that the kids with the highest self-esteem are the most likely to be the mean girls or the jerks. Uh, and so it, it's very important that your child's sense of value not come from comparing themselves to other people mm and feeling like they're all that. Something much more powerful is to help them learn self-compassion. To be able to relate to themselves as a human being that is a mix of beautiful and but ugly. You know, a mix of brilliant and really stupid. We all make mistakes. And being able to have that sense of forgiveness and mercy um, that Becky talked about, that, that ability mm -hmm. to say, I'm wrong, I was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me. That's huge. There's actually a website, self-compassion.org. <laughs> Um, a woman at uh, UT Austin, Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, has done a tremendous job researching this. For all of you, it'd be great to go online and do the self-assessment questionnaire, because it turns out that, the, that if we lack compassion for ourselves, we're probably lacking in compassion with the people mm -hmm. that are closest to us. And if there's one thing our children need from us is a sense of compassion and empathy. One thing uh, that's related to anxiety and depression that Becky touched on that is so powerful is, is this, the concept of serving. Um, in recent years, there's a big move in psychology called positive psychology that has done tremendous research in looking not just what makes us less miserable or deals with anxiety and depression, what makes us happy. Turns out that one of the, probably the, the thing that rises to the top of everything is the happiest people on the planet are people who serve. <laughs> and if you get your children to realize that our family unit ex ex exists for us, but we exist to make a difference in this dark world. And if you can engage your children in Toys for Tots or um, serving in the children's ministry at church or whatever, the reward that comes from that sense that I can make a difference for somebody else, God can use me to be a light in this dark world, that's where we, that's where we find a real sense of gratitude and really come into that. I, Praise you back because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. When I can, when I can bring all that I am to serve others, that's huge. Can I ask Paul a question? Absolutely. <laughs> After that, <laughs> would you say that if this hasn't been a part of your family and now you've got teenagers, is it worth it to lay down the law and say on Saturday everybody's going to the soup kitchen or whatever? Well, I would, I would try to do it in a different way than laying down the law. Sure. I would try to cast a vision or connect it with something they want to do. Hey, listen, you want to go do this, um, I'll make a deal with you. You go spend two hours in the soup kitchen, you can go to, spend two hours at the mall with your friends or whatever. Um, try to, to attach the, 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 the pain the pleasure. Of, yeah, the pain with <laughs> some pleasure um, so that you, you collaborate with them rather than you know, laying down the law with them. But, um, but yeah, I think it's never too late. 
And when um, they get there, they enjoy it. Yeah. You just have to get One of the things I just want to touch on, uh, something else that Becky shared, was that your child is practicing being an adult. And um, I'm reading a book right now that I think is awesome called Untangled by Lisa, Lisa Damore. Mm -hmm. um, it's about parenting teenage girls, and I think it's phenomenal. But she uses a, an, an analogy of a child in a swimming pool, and that as the child is launching out from the side to swim, it's, it's similar to what your child is doing when they're trying to be, a, mm. be an adult. Mm -hmm. um, but whenever they, whenever they get tired, they have to come back to the edge. They have to come back to you and they'll have that moment where they connect with you and then they push off again. Mm -hmm. And what she suggests is that you just want to let their push-offs be as positive as, as possible and mm -hmm. not, you know, not <laughs> disrespectful or, yeah, mm -hmm. or traumatic. <laughs> but I love, the, I love what you said about they're practicing being adults and we have mm -hmm. to... We want to be able to empower them to do that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, perhaps we can take a couple questions from the crowd, uh, and we'll be respectful of your time. I can be loud enough. Fair enough. How we have a 14-year-old who's really decided that now's the time for disrespect. So how do you practically address this in a way that's not too heavily punitive? Do you want to handle it? Um, you, you can take a swing. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you can go. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things I, I like is just to say, that's not how we talk to each other in this house. Or would you like to try that again? Because I can't hear you when you're talking to me that way. Um, to try to give them a you know, chance to try a different approach. Um, and and, and you, can, you can let them know, listen, if you're intending to get a positive response from me, I think you need to, I, I need you to shift your, your tone because I'm not liking what I'm hearing. Just being able to try to let them know, hey, listen, I want to hear what you have to say, but the way you say it can be very uh, powerful in whether I really will give you the response that you want. And then what about between the siblings? Oh, the way they respond to each other? Well, I, I was kind of the tone police in our home. I. I hate whining, I hate complaining, I hate um, uh, snarky comments, and so, I, you know, like if, I, if I'm in another room and I hear that kind of negative uh, tone, I'm like in there, hey, I don't know what you guys are saying, but the way you're saying it is totally offending me. And just, you know, just get them to go at it again. If they, if they can't find a way to say it in a better way, I'm, well, I'm inclined to shut it down. But I don't know what you guys think. Well, uh, I agree 100% about just not making that an option. You know, we're, we're not going to be able to have this conversation if this is the way you're going to communicate with me. Uh, I think the only thing that I would add to that is um, taking time maybe after the uh, discipline or the timeout or whatever to just ask them, what? Why did you feel the need to talk to me that way? What what was what was going on yeah. in that moment? Did, did I say something that uh, hurt your feelings? Uh, did something happen at school? You know, wh wh whatever the case may be, so that they can begin to connect. Oh, okay, uh, this was happening inside of me, and I didn't even know it, but I'm taking it out on mm. you. Nice. And sometimes some humor. So for the girls growing up, this means, oh, you love me? Oh, I love you too. <laughs> or the snarky back and forth, okay, neither of you can leave the room until you kiss. <laughs> Obviously, you get much more groaning, but eventually we all end up laughing and they get the point. But yes, an eye roll always means I love you. I like that. Yeah. I always say, you just rolled your eyes so hard I can hear it. <laughs> uh, perhaps one more question. Yes. How do you get around and thinking you're constantly judging them? I have a 16-year-old daughter who hit us with that not too long ago, trying to just give them your thoughts on what they did or didn't, and all of a sudden, you're really judging their every breath. <laughs> oh, I am. A, I am. <laughs> a, I am. B, I have the right to. No, I'm teasing. Uh I guess be, being a good listener, letting them unload it all, unload it all. 
Uh, and I have been told by mine more than once, I'm a fixer. And so I immediately say, well, you shouldn't have done, you, you, you should do this and you shouldn't do that. And they'll say, I need your advice. I just want you to listen. So sometimes I think we do jump to judging and fixing. Um, try to sit back and just listen if there's danger involved or I'm going to be raising a grandbaby or some of that. Then, no, I'm a fixer. But I, I do think trying to listen, but also letting him know I am the parent. Yeah. Um, I like what Paul said about how you, you don't have to turn every conversation into a teachable moment. Yeah. You know, some of them you can just. It's just kind of and I bet that's harder for moms than dads. It is. Like, yes. My husband can have those easy, and I have to bring it back up in the next three weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can sometimes say, hey, is there a way that I can share my perspective without it feeling like judgment to you? And just put it back on them. Like, is there a way? Because there may not be. They may say, no, I'm going to hear it as judgment anyway. Like, okay, I got that. One, th uh, one thing that I think is worth repeating, a, a man told me a number of years ago who'd done a lot of work with teens, he said, in every interaction um, with a parent, a child is asking two questions. The first question is, do you love me? Mm -hmm. The second question is, what are you made of? And I think it, it's really helped me mm -hmm. um, to That's think, good. What, what's, what's happening in this interaction? What are they asking of me, and how can I respond to show them I love them and what I'm made of? And that's, that, to me, is, is really what we want to do for our kids. And while they do need those boundaries and even want those boundaries, don't expect them to take it laying down. I mean, <laughs> they're going to come at you. Excellent. Well, if you have any other questions that we don't have time to get to tonight, uh, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and email those our way. You can send them to fsm at faithbridge.org. Uh, and we'll get you an answer either from uh, the Slagles or Dr. Paul here. And perhaps uh, if it's an excellent enough question, we might uh, make it the topic of a future parent workshop. Uh, mm -hmm. But for tonight, let's give these fun folks another round of applause. Absolutely. So as I even look at them up here on stage, I think we heard the what and the why of students' brains and why they are operating the way that they do. And then we got to hear the practical parenting tips for their brain specifically and just in general as we move toward our students to raise them to love Jesus. Um, so a few things I want you to know before we leave for the night are um, we are able to email the slides that, that you saw to you. So those of you who are taking pictures, you'll now have a better version of those. <laughs> you won't have to zoom in on your phone over and over. So we can get you those slides. We will email them soon, um, soon to you guys. Uh, there are resources in the back of your booklet. So there's a list of books. There's a list of counselors even that FaithBridge recommends in case that is a need that you realize could help your student. Um, and also we have recorded this evening. So that will also be posted online in the future for you to go back on as all of these things continue to soak in and seep in for you. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is um, just like I think Dan said, lines of communication are open not only from parents to students, but us to students and us to y'all as well. So please feel like you can reach out to us and we seek wisdom oftentimes from other people as well. So please feel like you guys can reach out to us as student staff. So with that, that's all on my list. So I will pray for us and then y'all can go home to your families and your students. <laughs> Well, God, thank you for this evening. Um, we just thank you for the wisdom from the three people sitting on stage. God, that they have come through a lot of experience and a lot of training and expertise and knowledge to be able to share with us how to better show you to our students. And God, thank you for that. Thank you for tonight. And would we leave here going home refreshed and renewed um, having some new things to try or new ways to talk to our students to help engage them um, and what is going on in their minds. So God, thank you for tonight. We love you and pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.